Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Harvard Catholic Forum. I am Deacon Tim O'Donnell, Program Director here, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our lecture this evening, both those with us here in Harvard Square and our virtual audience on Zoom. The Harvard Catholic Forum's mission is to share the riches of Catholic thought and culture with the academic, artistic, and professional worlds that converge in and move out of uh, this place of Catholic life, thought, and worship in the midst of Harvard Square. In addition to our lectures, we offer non-credit courses, master classes, and a recently announced summer seminar. Our programming continues to grow. Pick up a handy pr printed brochure on your way out about our coming events. And by all means, check out our website at harvardcatholicforum.org where you can sign up for our newsletters, register for future events, and support our important mission by making a financial contribution. All of our programs are given free of charge, but they are not free to put on. So please help us continue our mission. Tonight's event uh, will be archived on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, Please share the link to that channel with friends, colleagues, parishes, institutes, chaplaincies, or anyone interested in scripture or theology. Our post-event YouTube participation always exceeds the numbers that we reach on day one. Tonight's lecture honors the, the memory of Father Dan Harrington SJ, a model scholar, uh, teacher, and priest whose life and work exemplified all that is best in a Catholic engagement with the sacred page. His publications ranged from highly technical work with texts and languages to scholarly articles and monographs, but also included books, magazine articles, and commentaries that with unmatched clarity from the depths of the Bible for a general audience. After completing his PhD in Near Eastern Languages at Harvard, Father Dan was a professor first at the Western Jesuit School of Theology here in Cambridge, and then at its successor, the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, where he profoundly influenced students from all over the world as a teacher and mentor, um, including myself and my wife. And finally this, so many of us knew, knew Father Dan as a priest, a preacher, and a pastoral presence. In particular, Every Sunday for nearly 20 years, he celebrated the noon mass at St. Peter's in Cambridge, and then at 5 p.m. went over to the mass at St. Agnes in Arlington, which he celebrated, and this is the parish where he grew up. Tonight, we are able to honor his memory by having his co-sponsors, the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, St. Peter's Cambridge, and the Catholic parishes of Arlington. We also welcome Dan's brother, Ed, and his wife, Marilyn, who are joining us on Zoom this evening. Other co-sponsors from around the country include the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago, the Collegium Institute at Penn, the Nova Forum at USC, the Abigail Adams Institute here in Cambridge, a special welcome to you, um, the St. Benedict Institute at Hope College, and the St. Paul's Catholic University Center at the University of Wisconsin. After tonight's program, Zoom participants will receive a questionnaire by email. Those who are here in person can look on the brochure with future events and take a picture with your phone. There will be the same survey there. We would very much appreciate it uh, if everyone, both our virtual audience and those here, would fill out a questionnaire and give us feedback. Before I introduce our speaker, let me give you a roadmap of tonight's event. The lecture will last 30 minutes or so, and then we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. Those of you who are here in person should have received a note card and pencil when you came in. If you have a question, please write it on the card. Shortly after 8 p.m., someone will come up the aisle and collect the cards and bring them to me. I will pass on as many questions as I can. Unfortunately, we are not set up technically 
to take questions from our virtual audience at the same time. The lecture this evening will refer to some texts printed on a handout that our in-person audience uh, should have received on entering. If anyone is missing that handout, please put your hand up and someone will bring you one. Zoom registrants have a PDF download on registration, and you can also find it by going to the Harvard Catholic Forum website to our events. Our speaker tonight is John D. Levinson, List Professor of Jewish Studies at Harvard Divinity School. Professor Levinson is an internationally recognized authority on the interpretation of the Jewish Bible over the centuries, on philosophical and theological issues in biblical studies, and on the relationship of Judaism and Christianity, both in antiquity and in modern times. Among his numerous books and dozens of articles are The Love of God, Divine Gift, Human Gratitude, and Mutual Faithfulness in Judaism, Princeton University Press, 2016. He received his AB, MA, and PhD from Harvard, and has taught here since 1988. His talk goes straight to the heart of biblical faith, the love of God. But there's a problem. Despite, the central import, despite its central importance, this love proves hard for us to grasp in its fullness. And this is not only because of the usual challenges of interpreting an ancient text, but also because of our own assumptions. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say confusions about what love is in the first place. Professor Levinson meets this problem head on in tonight's lecture entitled Recovering Biblical Love from Emotionalism and Eroticism. Please join me in, welcome, in welcoming Professor John Levitz. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone else associated with the Harvard County Forum for being possible for me to speak here tonight. And I won't name all those co sponsors, but I'll be somebody often in the program that was not in some such place. So uh, I won't do that. Uh, I also appreciate the fact that you mentioned a, a book of mine. You know, uh, a lot of academics are egotistical and uh, narcissistic, and they require their students to uh, to read their own books. I'm not in Harvard, not with egotistic or narcissistic in Harvard, but in other places I've read that's the case. Uh, I don't do that. I don't require them to read my books. I only require them to buy my books. <laughs> I didn't do any good. You need to take out the library. What does that do? Buy it. Uh, second copy, did you want to read it again? <laughs> Maybe there's a paperback. Maybe you have a friend that wants it. It was done for your Christmas tree, whatever. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate that. It's also, uh, on a more serious note, uh, an honor to speak in memory of uh, Dan Harrington. I knew him in graduate school back in Carolina, and they in the same department in the Middle uh, Bronze Age. And uh, he, uh, he was a phenomenally learned and productive scholar, as you all know. Uh, he was also a Catholic priest who was keenly aware of the Jewish origins of Christianity and the complicated relationships with Jews and Christianity over the centuries and of uh, changes in Catholic doctrine in more recent centuries. But most of all, what I remember about Dan was what an extraordinarily kind and generous person he was. He didn't just uh, talk the talk, he walked the walk. I remember that I used to see him in Cambridge walking with his professor, the late uh, John Strunkel, who had multiple uh, health uh, problems in his life. He was very much alone. And Dan would be out walking with his own teacher, helping his own teacher uh, many, many times. A uh, very, uh, very beautiful thing uh, to watch, but very, very typical of the man. My subject, as Deacon O'Donnell mentioned, is the love of God. And that's, of course, a central command in Judaism. It's actually a mitzvah. It's actually a commandment in Judaism, Deuteronomy 6 5. It's part of the daily, twice daily recitation of the Shema, of the passage that the Jews are mandated to recite every morning and every evening. In the New Testament, it's quoted in Matthew 22, 22 and elsewhere as the greatest commandment of the Torah, the greatest, most important commandment in the Torah. But what exactly is love? Uh, I think if you ask the average American what love is today, they would probably say it's a sentiment. 
It's uh, this instinctive response that most people have in contemporary culture. It's a sentiment, it's an affect, it's a feeling that you get. Uh, years ago, when I taught at uh, another university, I had a, a, a colleague who was a, a German, a Protestant New Testament scholar, uh, who once said the problem with American religion is it's mostly just sentimentality. And that's an overreaction, an overstatement, uh, but has a lot of truth in it. Uh, how religious you are depends on, uh, uh, in their mind, on how deeply you feel something. The more deeply you feel it, the more religious you are. If you're not feeling it that deeply, you're not all that religious. Uh, and I remember years ago, many, many years ago, I was sitting in a language land next to a certain person who's become a prominent person, a prominent uh, scholar, and he was doing his language, I was doing my language, whatever it was, and he proceeded to tell me that he's not religious. Do I care? Right? And then he proceeds to tell me, oh, really, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. I'm trying to get your face, it's not an ice cream thing. <laughs> and, what, what is that? and he tells me the reason he's not religious is he doesn't feel anything. He says, You're never afraid. And if I told you to cobra around your leg, you just feel something. It's like this. I would right now bored of me. <laughs> uh, but, but that's the idea that religion has to do with, with feeling. Um, of course, this renders religiousness or lack of religiousness essentially incommunicable. It's basically beyond critique. How can you critique someone's feelings? How can you communicate a feeling? Always inevitably best. Uh, how can you communicate something that makes no cognitive or historical claims? It's purely subjective, purely internal. And this, in its own way, uh, reinforces uh, relativism. It draws on relativism, but also reinforces relativism. You can criticize my ideas, but you can't criticize my feelings. You know, my feelings, they belong to me, and therefore you have no business criticizing <clears> them. <throat> of course, when I deal with um, relativism, I argue with relativists, I always have a way of winning the argument. I conclude by saying, you know, relativism may be okay for you, but it's not okay for me. <laughs> <laughs> they, never, they never have a tongue back for that. Um, um, but surely all sentiments, all feelings, wax and wane. And sometimes they're absent for long periods of time. And how can you command the consent of how can you say you shall love the Lord your God, as Deuteronomy 6 5 does? If in fact love is a sin, how do you command someone to love? And if love obligates us to do certain things or not to do others, are those obligations suspended during the dry periods? Uh, as it were, when people aren't feeling anything, they're feeling particularly motivated, maybe motivated. If so, I fear the love in question is rather transient, rather shallow, and so a self-serving phenomenon, rather like marriage in a culture of no-fault divorce, or like romantic relationships in the hookup culture in which so many people in the second world now live and move and have their being. Of course, not in our um, But uh, in other words, it's a, it's a short-term uh, heavy phenomenon, transient, comes and goes with the feelings and uh, no, no stable commitment. Well, how could you have uh, any sort of permanent, any sort of continuing relationship where it's founded on something uh, as much like a quicksand as that? The obligation to love God is in the text I just mentioned to you, text one on your handout. This is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions which I, with which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children, recite them when you stay at home, when you're away, when you lie down, and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your uh, gates. Now, uh, you can see from this text that the first two verses really are uh, uh, continuous. The Lord is our God, and the Lord's a proper name. It's not a general term, it's a proper name. It's the four letter name of God, which in Jewish tradition is not to be uh, pronounced. That's why you see it in large and small caps in this translation. One of the few four letter words I've ever said. And uh, the, uh, the, the acclamation of the distinctive kingship exclusive relationship of that God to the people of Israel is described in the next verse, 6 5, as total, exclusive, all embracing, all encompassing love. I think in Rechad, the word uh, uh, alone, the last word in 
the text one is translated as alone rather than one. And what we have in, in both those verses is the affirmation of the exclusive claim of the covenantal suzerain upon this covenantal vassal, the people of Israel. There's a particular relationship which I'm calling and they call, you see this in a second, covenant. And that involves an exclusive and continuing uh, relationship uh, demanding total fidelity, total loyalty, uh, uh, without uh, exception. Um, in this covenantal idiom of monotheism, which is the only idiom of monotheism really, which is, which is not the only uh, idiom of monotheism in the Hebrew Bible, but dominates in the, in the Pentateuch, we still call it Pentateuch. Uh, the key point is not how many gods there are. It's not the mono of monotheism, it's not how many deities there are. The point, again, is not philosophical, it's practical. It's a matter of service. Israel is to honor the claims of that God, Hashem, the God represented by the Lord, the name of God, alone, and to serve him alone, as Deuteronomy insists on several occasions. As in the Decalogue, as in the Ten Commandments, whether other gods exist or not is simply not addressed. And beside the point of this covenantal idiom of monotheism, the question is, whom do you serve? And how many gods do you serve? And whom do you serve above all else? That's the key covenantal question. And that's the meaning, that's one of the meanings of love in that context. So the point about monotheism, so you can see this in, in text uh, two. Uh, know therefore, this is Deuteronomy 7, 9 through 10. Know therefore that only the Lord, that's that part of your God, is God, the steadfast God who keeps his covenant, that's the key term, faithfully to the thousandth generation of those who love him, and keep his commandments. Notice the kind of equation there, uh, the apposition there, who love him and keep his commandments. But who instantly requires the destruction of those who reject him, never slow uh, with those who reject him, the word is hate him as opposed to love, but requiring them uh, instantly. So the um, the point is is a, a practical one. It's not how many gods exist, but whom are you are you serving? And the total service of God in that context, the structure of covenant, that's what they mean by love. So the point about monotheism, I think, in both the larger Jewish and Christian traditions, and quite possibly yeah, in Islam as well, is nicely put in text to me, this book by the scholar Washington Jaffe. He said he talks about monotheism as something in, as exists in those traditions, the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions as involving a, a personal God, not simply, it's not a monism, it's not a philosophical monism, it's a personal God who has reached into history to form a group for his service. He said, he calls this elected monism. Elected doesn't mean optional here. Elected means having to do with what Christians tend to call election, and we Jews tend to be, 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 that Leviticus 1919 follows Leviticus 1918. Right? And Leviticus 1918 is the, is the verse that concludes with the famous Mahafta Recha Mocha, you shall love the Lord, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, people who say, well, uh, we only, uh, you know, some things make sense, they totally sense. It's interesting that the ancient compiler of that law, they have a law that says, you shall, this is Leviticus 1918. You shall not practice vengeance. You shall not hold a grudge, but you shall, uh, against the members of your people, and exclusion there, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The Lord commands that.
is done for uh, the lesser king. He's done things for the lesser king, the lesser king does not deserve, does not deserve. And that in turn elicits gratitude. When someone has done something for you, you normally feel grateful. It's been said that grateful gratitude is a moral affect. You feel gratitude, you feel that it is good, you should do something in return. Maybe all you do is say thank you, but you do something in return. There's some sort of obligation to that he is on Christ. You have to come be home. No wonder, simply from having received an image of the according to the sense the text to illustrate this is text four. Again, from Deuteronomy, this is the book that talks the most about Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 8. For you, this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. For you are a people consecrated, a holy people, to the Lord your God. Of all peoples on earth, the Lord your God chose you to be his treasured people, chose you to be his treasured people. It's not because you're the most numerous of people that the Lord set his heart. It's a strongly passionate erotic term. And the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. Indeed, you're the smallest of peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he made to your fathers that the Lord freed you with a mighty hand and rescued you from the house of bondage from the power of Pharaoh to Egypt. You, people of Israel, it's not because you were so numerous. It was an affair of the heart. God can see this erotic passion for your ancestors. Made a promise to them that involved this gift of life. A promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the founding patriarchs. And that is the reason for the Exodus. They could fulfill that land with. That's the reason for the Exodus. It's not, it's not any sort of principled opposition to slavery. So there's something about love. What is the, the centrality of love to this uh, to this verse four? Not because you're so numerous. Uh, you know, it's been said that uh, the total uh, said that the total number of Jews in the world is less than the margin of statistical error in the Chinese census. The food we have on well, who is eating in those Chinese restaurants on Christmas Eve? <laughs> That's really true. You want to have to stay in business. Uh, but the, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's something irrational. I think in, in contemporary American English, we'd say it's a matter of chemistry. Two people go out, they may fit perfectly on some internet dating app or whatever, and it just doesn't work. Two other people go out, they're very, very different, right? They're different from each other. And if they can never work, and it works beautifully, and it ends up in a stable, long lasting marriage. That's what we mean by chemistry. It doesn't reduce to merit efforts to explain why it worked with this one and not that one. It doesn't quite do the trick. There's some other mysterious dimension to it. The reason one loves someone else never quite do the trick with accounting for the law. They never exhaustively account for it. Think of the emotive and involuntary associations of a term like falling in love. Falling suggests something involuntary. It says something fun. It turns like chemistry to describe why a man works and when another when another they are just as, as good uh, when judged by external factors. It doesn't work. Well, this is what this text for is saying uh, the relationship of God to the people of Israel is. It wasn't based on their merit, it wasn't based on numbers. For some reason, God formed this love of their ancestors. It doesn't say why we are. The many traditional world groups can fill in the gaps in that, as to why what the ancestors did to, to sense the merit of this. But do you ever really merit being loved? Is there something uh, gratuitous, uh, gracious in the very nature uh, of love? I think that I think so. I think this is what we're seeing here is very far from notions of human merit, or for that matter, of God as a just and equitable judge. And this God simply fell in love with the first fathers of people, Israel, and Israel, and Israel. And all one can do as a result is to respond with gratitude, fidelity, and obedience. But not with pride. How can you be proud of being loved by somebody? Uh, uh, in a sense, humility is, is essential to the love of God. It's not, uh, it's not uh, something extreme. It's essential to this, this type of relationship. It underscores and derives from the giftedness of that love. Uh, that's what I'll tell you nicely uh, in the text five. Text five is a text from the Babylonian Talmud. 
small. You see how this develops out of uh, text, uh, uh, text 4 verse 7. It's not because you're the most rigorous. What's that? It's hard to say about how shocking it's the first time from you and chose you. Indeed, you're the smallest. The country, this is I said to her, you because even when there's no greatness in you, you make yourself small for me. And there's no greatness on Abraham. And he said, oh, it's just ashes. On Moses' family, indeed, Moses said, we're nothing. On David, he said, but I'm a worm, that's new. But that's not the way it is among the idolaters. I was still greetings on Nimrod, and he said, Come, let us build a city for us. And also, the tower was talking to him to make an interest of the tower of Babylon, the place prior to Nimrod, who came to the German as, Let us rebel, Nimrod, let us rebel. And the practical thing is, rebellion against God, according to this rebellion text. But Pharaoh, he said, Who is the Lord that actually he is? That is your God. And I'll smack him. And he said, He said, Who among all of the gods of those countries saved their country for me? And the Lord should save Jerusalem for me. We are arrogant. Or on Nebuchadnezzar, he said, I will mount the back of a cloud. I will match, uh, I will match the most high. I will fly up and, and, and be equal to God. And the king how I'm tired. He said, I sit enthroned like a god in the heart of the sea. Now, if you actually look at the biblical text of the quote, they don't really identify with these figures, the Nimrod and Samaria and, and, and Hiram, but do uh, yeah. Now, but the point is to say that these idolatrous uh, enemies of the people of Israel and the God of Israel, they imagine themselves the equal of them. And uh, they, they're exactly the opposite of the response that one is supposed to have to the love of God, which involves an intense uh, uh, humility. So, uh, there's a big difference in between the, the love of God as an objective genitive and the love of God as the subject genitive. God is the recipient of the love, and God is the giver of the love. The objective genitive does not apply a personal. God, you can love in some sense, many of you can love in two things. You can love in deodorant if you use it. Uh, you, can, you can, a lot of things you can, you can love. Uh, one can love an idea, a work of art, an activity, a food, or whatever. Uh, but ideas, works of art, food, activities, and they don't love us. Uh, this is a very loose definition of love. You just have love in two things to us. One love of art. Uh, but a personal God, a God with personality, even only very distantly, imperfectly analogized to human personality, does love. Loves as persons love. And when we find to be backward at those who prefer the more philosophical or scientific model of today, a supreme being, a ground of being, the force behind nature, or some such thing. We got on the Bible for better for worse is intensely personal forms, intense personal relationships. And in the Bible, the subjective genitive, God as the lover, the one doing the loving, uh, implies preference, specificity, whether theological language being called chosenness or election. Uh, I don't think the word election is in this uh, sense because I think to many Christians, and many Christian denominations, Election implies those, those who are elected by those who are saved, as opposed to those who are damned. So those who are going to heaven as opposed to those who are going to heaven. That would take out Whereas this is quite the opposite. This is, this is it's for irrational reasons or inexplicable reasons, both analogized to falling in love, those reasons of chemistry, God has chosen a specific group, selected that specific, uh, that specific group. Uh, it's not some universal benevolence that we're talking about. Uh, as the covenant institution implies, it's like the love of one's kin. That's what we mean by preference. And uh, inevitably, in particular, and not simply a diffuse and universal kind heartedness. 
The example I give in, in class is like this. You know, a college student comes home, they've been away a year, they go back to Arkansas, Kansas after a couple months at Harvard, and they go down, they got the, you know, the plane to be the level bearer, and the parents are waiting for them, and they say, that's it. The parents are waiting. You get off the plane, the parents are three months, as long as they've been away. And they go to the picture, the parents see the picture, run up and kiss them and hug them. They were so happy. And then, as the child is getting his or her bags, or she notices that the parents are doing the same to each person who gets off. Everybody says, I'm going to hug them and kiss them. I'm saying, I'm so happy you're to having a seat. Now, I would say that's much of egalitarian. If the idea is to go by justice, in the sense of equality, that's a big advance. But you see, the matter of the speech to manage a relationship and a person not being in a dog, it's a big setback. It suggests it's a serious, serious uh, a problem there. Uh, so inevitably, this type of love, where God is loving, does imply some element of preference that's picked up by words that they were like chosen as an election. So then you have the dichotomy inevitably develops of the inside and the outsider. In the Bible, it's Israel in the church, Israel in the, in the nations, Israel in the nations, and in the Hebrew Bible and the Rabbinic tradition. In the church, the Christian tradition, it's the world uh, versus the church, the church and the world, not the same. The church is not to conform itself to the world, it's a difference between the church and the world, not the same. Um, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with outsiders. It's not that the parents think there's something wrong with everybody else getting off the plane. They don't think everybody's going to be necessarily is going to hell. Uh, but they, uh, they're uh, necessarily doomed in the world, being rejected by God and the outsiders. Uh, just as other children getting off the plane. They're not rejected by the parent who writes that this is his or her, his or her own child. That's the danger you see the term of election that it means. Uh, promotion into a higher status in some sort of objective scale. So some people will see this, I think not totally wrongly, as anti-democratic. Uh, that parent who hugs everybody in our friends is much more democratic than this uh, yeah. And uh, there's a tendency in modern egalitarian circles to play now and be embarrassed by it and have chosen this in election. And this often correlates, as far as I can see, with the tendency to play down family and the family and other and unchosen figurements in general. A tendency to favor what we call pure contractarian concept of morality and commitments. We only have those obligations we chose we chosen to have. We only have those relationships we've chosen to have. But what if you find yourself in a relationship? Because something has happened to you, something like falling in love, something like, you know, for example, something all of us under the being born, for example, raise your hand for more. <laughs> no one no one was born again. Uh, but uh, well, did you deserve to be born? And what have you done to merit that? You're born to certain circumstances. Survive mortality in the first year. Do you pay credit for that? Did you have to be vaccinated in the room? Probably not. Uh, everybody is, is the recipient of certain goods that show this is gratitude and a sense of obligation, which they didn't really, they didn't really bargain on. A pure contract tariff comes around, and whatever, whatever use it has, everything it deals with the contingency of, of human life. So, this love of God is a subjective reality, a subjective love of God as lover. Uh, involves uh, uh, another story of the personalness of the relationship, which can seem, and the graciousness of the relationship, which can seem in some ways is akin to arbitrariness. You really can't say why. It doesn't base itself purely on a calculus of merit. It's not something freely chosen. You find yourself in a relationship. You find yourself uh, with certain parents that you may not have chosen to have, but they're still your parents. And this, this, uh, is a community kind of morality and theology and familial relationship very, very natural to the human body. And, uh, Finally, I'd like to say I'm going to favor empty rituals. There is a very high ideal of the love of God, the one that sees, for example, in 
particular explicitly in medieval Judaism. If you look at text 6 from my Monday's Bishop Thoreau, the whole Shiva 10 3, you see a text by the great uh, legal codifier in this case, a philosopher, a commentator, leader, and physician, Maimonides, living in Egypt in the 12th century. And here's what he says in text 6. What then is the right love? What is the What then is the right love? How do you love God? It's a love of God so great, surpassing, and abounding, and intense. The one is bound up with heart and soul, bound up with heart and soul with the love of God, and was ever enthralled by it. Like the love state, whose minds are never free of love for the woman by whom they cease to be enthralled, but the city God was standing up, eating or drinking. Greater still should be the love of God in the hearts of his lovers. Ever enthralled, greater than that should be the love of God in the hearts of his lovers. Ever enthralled by it, as we were charged with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind throughout the six body of you. This is what Solomon means when speaking figuratively. He says, I'm sick of love. Psalm of Songs 2 5. Indeed, the entire Psalm of Songs is a figure for this thing. A figure, an allegory, or whatever you want to call it, but something is totally out an allegory or figure of four love God. So the mind says it should be one's constant animated central passion, as if you were like a teenager or preteen experiencing puppy love. You can't think about anybody except this this person. That's what people are supposed to walk around doing while functioning as he did as a philosopher, a legal codifier, a rabbi, a physician. Okay. Um, that's the idea. So why do I say I want to say something in favor of the, the rituals? Well, let's go back to our first point. The love of God uh, is more than a matter of affect. It's connected to action, to observing God's commands. Um, there's an affective subjective dimensions. Human beings are never without either affective or uh, subjective or objective dimensions. And efforts to distinguish them originally are unrealistic, so they're not physical. But at least emotions are fleeting. Emotions are fleeting, they're insecure, they usually don't last long, good or bad, they don't last long. Much more uh, long lasting than emotions are uh, habits. Good habits are bad habits, habits are much harder to break. Emotions come and go, habits are much, much more, uh, uh, much harder, much more perennial. And what is ritual, if not a habit? Well, not a ritual that's regularly engaged in. And a habit, it becomes a ritual. It seems to me that observing a ritual can rekindle that emotion to the one who speaks of. It can rekindle the intention, even when it's disappeared, even during the dry periods, even the periods when the feeling is not there, when the affect is, has vanished, or has, has quiesced to the point you don't even hear the feelings. Nonetheless, the ritual can reignite, the ritual can, can bring it back. The ritual keeps the ideal in front of you, and by acting a certain way, you don't believe what you what you what you uh, act as it is. You know, uh, actions can produce affects. It's not just affects produce actions. But actions can produce affects. Like the story is told about the two behavioral psychologists that pass each other. One said the other, "Hi, hi, hi." The external uh, action can generate the internal affect. Uh, the ritual, the actual got the highest intention behind it to remind us of what it should be doing. If the ritual only depends on the intention, only depends on what in Judaism we call Kamalah, intention, direction, uh, personal intention, uh, it often will be, the, the action will be very, very sweet, very insecure, very episodic. This is nicely indicated in text 7. This is from the Sikhan Yom Kahana, which is the word of the Binnigan Hosh, the work of the Binnigan interpretation of biblical verses, probably 6th century commentary or something like that. Although the figures we're talking about here are 3rd century Babylonian, 3rd century Babylonian figures, text 7. Ralph Hunga and Rabbi Jeremiah said in the name of Rabbi Hiyamah, it is written, they abandoned me and did not keep my Torah. Jeremiah 61. That's the verse of the exegete. They abandoned me and did not keep my Torah, not keep my law. If only they had kept my Torah. Would they abandon me and kept my Torah? The amazing statement to me. Would they abandon me and God, but kept my Torah? For if they abandoned me and kept my Torah, the starter dough that is in it 
would have brought them back to me. The story of the East, whatever you call that, in, in a, would have brought them back. It would have had an effect. If you kept up the rituals, even as an empty ritual, the rich angel would have come back. But when you abandon the ritual, you stop saying it, stop doing it, you make it hard to do it, even harder to, to return to it. Well, who has said, study for one. Even if not for its own sake, ideally, the Jew is supposed to study for, for its own sake, Mishma, purely for its own sake, not because it gives you higher status or money or social connections. Study for it, even if not for its own sake, for the very fact that you're studying it, but not for its own sake, and because you're involving yourself with it, you will turn back and do it for its own sake. I know that always happens, but it often does happen. And uh, so uh, it's not just the motivation for me to actions. The relationship is actually bi-directional. Actions can be the motivations, and in the case of the love of God, actions can keep the relationship in view, even when it seems distant and unrealistic. This, I think, is a very nice thing in that text uh, on your handout. So my conclusion is this. And this evening, we have only touched a bit on the theme and very interesting of the role of God and human body. But I hope I'm actually going to show that it's gone into a lot of depth to show you that the love of God is both one of the most commonly misunderstood ideas. I think that he's often misunderstood in uh, ancient medieval and ancient medieval sources, and one of the most profound ideas at the same time. Very often misunderstood, identified with emotionalism, with eroticism, with some temporary uh, sort of thing, unconnected to law, unconnected to, uh, to morality. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's none of those things. One of the most misunderstood and one of the most profound. Perhaps you now have some sense of that profundity a bit better than it did when we began. Thank you very much. So let's go to the song of songs. Okay. You look like you're to read them along. Maybe uh, two questions. The, the first, really, you touched on the song of songs being um, an allegory, but not only an allegory, or only one. Could you um, excellent, that? excellent question. Uh, the song of songs, at its plain sense level, Looks like a couple of which I call more Renaissance teenagers longing for each other's bodies, full of sexual brutal entendres, very, very beautiful poetry, very beautiful poetry. Uh, but it's a set of love songs, uh, and uh, the plain text has to seem like. Now, when you look a little deeper at it, you see a couple of interesting things. One is we don't know who these singers are. You know, Shira, 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 the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Is Solomon writing it? Is it dedicated to Solomon? Is it, is it, is it Solomon the patron? Is it classified as wisdom or ritual? What does that even mean? Uh, and uh, it seems to be a relationship never quite, seems never quite to reach consummation. Uh, some religiously conservative types will say, oh, it's about uh, marriage. It's, Crazy marriage. How did they get married? Maybe they do it in the ninth chapter, but there are only eight chapters. Um, <laughs> you know, I haven't even seen a movie without a woman's uh, uh, But the, uh, so what do you think of a relationship, of a, a poem, a set of poems, about two people who are so important in the relationship, never in each other's presence, they long for each other, they're not quite seen, they're to be constantly together. The male lover seems to be gone. It comes to, to be a uh, spirit of the man, you know, he's gone, he's disappeared. I think that's chapter five. What do you make of that? Well, you can see how people thought, especially given the fact that it is in the Bible. And especially given the fact that the prophets described the relationship of the God of Israel to the people of Israel in erotic terms, some prophets, as uh, love as a erotic love affair as a marriage. Given that fact, early on the determination developed that actually the male lover is the God of Israel, the female lover is the people of Israel. 
And so what develops is uh, a tendency of just in, in religious education to read those verses in terms of specific historical moments in the God of Israel religion. When is this verse said? Is this about Israel as they're about to die in the wilderness or about to die at the sea? Is this what they say as they approach Sinai? Is this God first uh, revealing himself to Abraham? What, what, where is attempt, in other words, to look into the verses with named uh, speakers who matter? And what do we matter more in the context of the Hebrew Bible than the God of Israel and the people of Israel? And as this develops, this is very, very important in, in, in the Jewish tradition. In Christian tradition, you see it as Christ and his church, or you see it as the individuals from Jerusalem, the soul and God. The soul of the individual longing for God, it becomes a paradigm of the uh, of, of God uh, for his particular community and personal relationship. Right? Discuss the connection with collective monarchies. I hesitate to call it an allegory. This is not necessarily that one lover is truth, one lover is virtue, a philosophical allegory. It's rather uh, horizontally, rather vertically focused on the rest of the biblical canon. And when do these verses have been spoken? And when you do this, I just want to say one last thing. When you do this, when you read the book, the Song of Songs in, in terms of love, love of God, when you read it that way, some people say, well, you're getting rid of this, the vitality, the bond of the, of the, of the, of the two human lovers. Maybe so, to some extent. But think of it this way, those verses that you're associating with the Song of Songs, they actually are in Genesis, Exodus, whatever, you're now emphasizing it. God's um, uh, self revelation to Abraham, or God rescued Israel at the sea in Exodus 14 and 15. This is not motivated by love. And it doesn't say that in Genesis. It doesn't say that in Exodus. But when you read Genesis, Exodus, with the lens of the Song of Songs, you have a sense of a lot of the Bible. The rest of the Bible, and you make love a central theme in the verses where the plain sense it wasn't there. So it cuts both, both directions. So um, there's a whole tradition of mysticism and an ecstatic experience um, that comes out of the Song of Songs. Um, so, how does this very erotic book as the basis of that uh, mix with? Concerned about avoiding emotionalism and eroticism. I don't necessarily argue for avoiding emotionalism and eroticism. I have emotions myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I did mean, one side of one hand. It was a spirit from something that kind of climbed kind of, kind of, kind of up my calf. It was a spider you know, experiencing, uh, some, I guess, kind of a revulsion. Oh, God, I never had an emotion. But I don't try to avoid it. But I, 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 I'm bothered by is the reduction of the love of God to an actionless set of subjective experiences where something so internal, you can't have any public or communal or ritualized, habitualized expression. That's very different from what you see in ancient Judaism and Christianity. And in a lot of American religions now, even highly individualistic, subjectivistic, uh, that's what that tends to become. The religious based on one's own personal life journey that's idiosyncratic and you can't communicate. So I'm not I'm not saying to avoid those things, they are not I'm just saying that uh, they uh, infuse into kind of a unity in these texts, which is very hard for us in what with our modern categories to create. The image of parents greeting children um, coming off the plane is quite interesting. Isn't God the father of all mankind? So how could this love ever look like reading some and not all the passages without suggesting some of his creations are less meaning, meaningfully his children, less um, uh, worthy of his most intimate attention? And that's a very, very good question. Some people, I don't know that it implies they're less worthy of his attention. It doesn't say mean they're less worthy. I think this. If you're married, how do you relate to people you're not married to? You know, there are a lot of them out there. People all the time walk past people you're not married to. Do you rate them? Do you not really attend them? Do you think they're disgusting? Do you think they're disgusting? Uh, you know, there's a specific relationship here uh, 
which is it does in a sense, and in that sense, I agree with the question here, does in a sense uh, offend a kind of modern egalitarian democratic ethic. We're all equally citizens, and therefore everybody should get the same attention. That's kind of a modern governmental idea. Uh, modern Western liberal government uh, idea for us we have years or so. Uh, this is a, a model that is not does not deny the universal fatherhood doctrine of the So the people are universally regardless of what like something wrong to whether the Jews and Gentiles or, or Christians or black Christians or Muslims or non-Muslims. Uh, but at the same time, this is an ethic which I just call that unique community. There's that thing called the unique community. That's the universal and particular tension that I'm talking about. If you told the universal that you shouldn't have unique communities, you shouldn't say you're a Jew, you're a Christian, you're, you shouldn't say that. You should say, I'm just a human being, there's an all purpose human being. Uh, you know, the story is told, I, 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 I read this someplace. I, about a certain uh, philosopher having to be Jewish, you know, a Jewish philosopher in New York, who wanted to illustrate to his class that uh, there's really no such thing as uh, pure Platonic ideas, at least not in the earthly world we live in. So he went and took them to a restaurant, and when the waiter waitress came up and said, well, What do you have? He said, oh, We have soup. She says, well, we have tomato soup, we have matzo ball soup, we have onion soup, we have vegetable soup. They said, no, I just have soup. They said, well, you know, we have chicken soup, we have rice soup, and no, we just a soup. Right? <laughs> now, to a certain extent, the person who's nobody's child doesn't exist. There are many people have particular identities. The question is, what's the relationship between the universal identity and the, uh, the particular identity? In the book of Genesis, this is described as universal humanity uh, created in the settlement of the in the image of God, in Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Everybody, before there's any national differentiation, everybody's created in the image of God. But then that, it, it makes some tension, but that's not set aside by God's singling out Abraham, and the Abraham family is descendants to Isaac, and Isaac's family is descendants to Jacob. Right? That it's not set aside by doing that. You can see there's a tension there, but it's not, it's not completely set aside. You can have it uh, in, in Genesis, there's a universal covenant with all the descendants of Noah, which is all of humanity from Genesis. Everybody has Noah. That's a universal Noahite covenant. But there's still a Hebrew covenant in that, almost like you're from the Earth, with the Russian doll or Chinese doll effect. Uh, one inside another, and that, that's how it works. I'm not saying there isn't any tension there, but by and large, simply say God is the is universal. It doesn't really capture, you know, it sounds true, but it doesn't really capture this element of what uh, it can cross the Question about justice. Um, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> Um, so God, uh, a loving God makes commandments, uh, commands. What if God commands something that is patently unjust? That's a big problem. That's a big problem. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have a, a, a solution to that. In other words, uh, you know, within... The Jewish tradition, the Vedic tradition, is a long tradition of interpretation. And uh, the way you might say of uh, diluting or invalidating laws that clearly offend any sense of justice, there are ways of handling that. There's an ongoing tradition you can do this. If you're a biblical literalist or all you have is scripture or whatever, and whatever it's got to be true, then you have to come down, down on the side of it. I've heard of the church the economic positivism. Maybe God said it's right, it's right, God said it, God said it. Steal the word, steal your word would be right. If you get in that, in that position, well, I don't put myself in that position. Uh, I think that, that becomes very, very, very problematic. Um, could you talk about this a little bit in terms of uh, in, in the situation of the binding of Isaac? Oh, the binding of Isaac. Uh, well, uh, if you look at the binding of Isaac, which is Genesis 22, 
in terms of uh, ethics. But if you went through the lens of ethics, this is a no brainer. If you don't go out and murder your son because a voice in your head told you to do so. Uh, but I think that uh, the uh, binding of Isaac is really not about ethics. It's not going to show Abraham what you're supposed to do to your son. Abraham is not every man. He's not every father. Isaac is not every son. There's a particular narrative in one text there. I think the actual lesson of the binding of Isaac is something rather different. Uh, it, it's, it's the story of Abraham come full circle. It begins with the same words Jesus going to that Jesus spoke again. And Abraham is first given his command. God first speaks to him and says, Never come. Get up and go. Me and your father's house will start with the land of our show. And in Genesis 22, God says, Isaac, Never come. Get up and go. The only time those two words actually occur in the Bible. It's two common words in the only term of construction uh, those two verses. And the deliver of the Get up and go and offer up your son, the one you love, the only son, the one you love, as a burnt offering. Isaac, offer him as a burnt offering. When God makes that initial promise to Abraham, get up and go, there was, he promises him to be a mind of blessing, which is to say, have great wealth. He's going to give him his own country. He's going to give him the numerous progeny. He's going to make him into a great nation. Not bad. The odds are just up to me. go. That sounds like a good deal to me. Wait a minute. I went back for money, wealth, or what was the lose? Uh, by the time you get to Genesis 22, though, the same words and very much the same structure is used to describe the opposite. Abraham has to give up what's most precious to him. The son on whom he has uh, bet, so to speak, his entire life. The son of the promise who he's waited all this time. The son who was a very, very senator, like one of the people who comes in, is uh, David Timothy in 13th century Provence, says that Abraham would rather have God have commanded him to kill himself than kill us. He's got to offer the love, and I think we've got to appreciate this sacrificially. It's not a question of murdering him or killing him. That's not the point. The point is offering up uh, this son, the son of the promise, back to the God of the promise. Will you do that? Will you act when it's not out for this? Not precious self-interest. In other words, are you just a Pavlovian dog who does the right thing as it pays off? Does the name Pavlov ring any bells? Uh, the, the, uh, are you a Pavlovian dog who's just training, whatever they call it, often conditioning house, they call it. Whatever I call it, call often conditioning house. Some psychologists will always tell me, oh, it's classical conditioning. I say classical conditioning, and say, no, it's not. It's conditioning. Or is it genuine righteousness, which means the willingness to engage in acts of renunciation and to act sacrificially? And that's why God is able to call off the, the, the sacrifice of Isaac, because he isn't sacrificed, precisely because, as it says, now I know that you fear me, now that you obey me. Now I know you're doing it out of obedience to God, not out of self interest or some other such calculation. I really think that's what the binding of Isaac is all about. Uh, people who put it into a context like a Sunday school lesson. I was supposed to do Abraham. I don't know, I was supposed to pass off his wife as his sister. And I come from West Virginia, I don't see the problem. But, but, uh, but, but uh, in other words, I don't think that's what the text is about. I don't think that's, I think that, I think that, that abstracts the story of Abraham from the narrative framework. And uh, also, it uh, over normalizes the text. I don't think really about morality in that well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I wanted to ask um, if uh, you could fill out the survey that you can get uh, by taking a picture with your phone on the, uh, the previous coming attractions. Uh, or those who are online will get one by email. Um, the Harvard Catholic Forum's events continue on Thursday, April 21st, with another lecture in our Faith and Work series. With Professor Mary Hirschfeld of Villanova speaks on work in the future, economic realities and insights from Catholic thought. 
And on April 25th, our sacred music series continues when we host the Harvard Glee Club singing Duraflay's Mess Comunido, preceded by uh, talks and an interactive experience of plain chant led by Thomas Kelly and Andrew Clark of the Harvard Music Department. For more on these and other programs, and to sign up for our newsletters, check out harvardcatholicforum.org. And remember, too, that you can help us in our ongoing mission by supporting us financially on our website. Thank you again for joining this conversation, and have a good evening.